Uh, so, so what's the reason the marijuana causes violence? Did, did, I, we talked about this yesterday. Are Some, off the marijuana? I'm sorry. Are they off? Yeah, you have the opposite reaction. <laughs> Uh, I mean, drunk people, people that drink alcohol aren't like they, dr they are when they drink alcohol when they're not drinking. If I get depressed when I drink, then when I'm not drinking, I'm happy. How about that? That's logical. Okay. I mean, if you've ever been around somebody that drank uh, on a re relatively regular basis, uh, part of the problem is you don't know who, who's coming home. Is the drunk guy coming home uh, or is it the sober guy coming home? If they're sober, sometimes they act one way, and if they're drunk, they act, act the opposite. That's part of the <laughs> No, it's not. Hello? Somebody trying to sell me insurance. Okay. I guess I could turn my... my Telephone off. Ah, uh, okay. Well, let's get started. Might as well. Uh, what was this? And all of this has changed in like the last five years. This opioid uh, uh, addiction, uh, this opioid problem is brand new. In 2000, uh, the AMA decided that they were, that we weren't uh, taking care of uh, the, the pain problem in the United States. A lot of people with back pain, a lot of people with neck pain uh, from automobile accidents, a lot of pain in the United States. They decided that we needed to do more. So they started uh, prescribing more uh, and stronger uh, opiates and opioids. Oh, this, and this happened in 2000. Uh, so the opioid and opiate uh, problem really expanded after 2001 because the AMA came out with their uh, with their new guidelines in 2000, and uh, after 2000, uh, well, in 2001 they started uh, prescribing more and more uh, drugs. I don't know. Has anybody been hurt lately? They probably gave you three or four weeks worth of, of painkillers. They did that to my wife. My wife had uh, hip surgery, and I, well, you can imagine. <laughs> they, they cut a hole in her, in her hip right here, and then they took the, 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 the joint and they snapped it off, and they stuck the steel thing down in her, into her bone, and they attached it to, 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 the, to her pelvis. Can you imagine how painful that is? I, she was, she was, and she had to sit up for the whole thing. It's not like she could lay down for her surgery. She was sitting up the whole time. That's how they do it. Anyway. <laughs> so they gave her a lot of painkillers. And sometimes she needed them. But she, I, the two of us talked about it. And uh, she agreed that uh, if she wasn't in pain, she wasn't going to take them. Uh, she tried to do, do without them as much as she possibly could. Uh, she had both hips done. <clears throat> She had, she had the right hip done in May. She had the left hip done in July. So I had a really fun summer. Uh, uh, so I hadn't seen her for three months. And I went home for Christmas. So what's the first thing that happened? <laughs> she got sick. <laughs> she was hospitalized for five days. No, she had cellulitis. Does anybody know what cellulitis is? <coughs> if you've ever seen somebody that's diabetic, a lot of times they get infections in their legs and they won't heal, that's cellulitis. It's a skin infection. But she had cellulitis. So she was in the hospital for five days getting intravenous uh, uh, treatment, antibiotic treatment. Anyway, great, great Christmas I had. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, so they kept asking her in the hospital, "Is this uh, how painful is this? Uh, on a scale of one to ten, uh, what's your pain threshold?" And at four, they started trying to give her opiates that she wouldn't take. She said, "Just give me Tylenol." Of course, Tylenol. There's a problem with Tylenol, isn't there? Has anybody ever been told what was wrong with Tylenol? It's really tough on your liver. It's really hard for the liver to, to get rid of that stuff. 
So if you've got uh, people that with uh, hepatitis C, uh, which is a infection of the liver, uh, they tell them not to uh, take, don't take Tylenol because it's too hard on your, on your liver and you're already destroying it. Uh, people that are, are drinkers, people that are alcoholics, they tell them not to take Tylenol. Take ibuprofen, take uh, aspirin, but don't take, don't take Tylenol. Because they're already uh, stressing their liver out, and here they're taking Tylenol, and potentially they're, they're destroying their liver even, even more. Anyway, not important. Yes, it is. All of this stuff is really, really important. Okay. Uh, uh, anybody have any questions? Uh, like I said, I, I don't have any, any good news for you as far as drugs are concerned. None of them are any good. They're all toxins. They're all alkaloids. And that's why they do things to you. Okay. <clears throat> Not even marijuana. A lot of people think marijuana is okay, and maybe it is okay for that person. It's just not okay for everybody. It's like alcohol. Some people have a strange reaction to alcohol. I mean, I get depressed. A lot of people get drunk and they get happy, or they get... <laughs> I try to stay away from drunks. They always want to punch me. I haven't quite figured that one out. I think <laughs> my face must look like a punching bag if you're a little bit drunk. Uh, so I try to stay away from it. Um, I don't want to tell that story. <laughs> uh, maybe that's why my face looks so funny. Uh, at present, there's a debate going on over the legalization of marijuana. Uh, ten states have legalized it. Uh, let me see if I can come up with a New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts. Wait a minute, there's one more. Uh, Michigan, Nevada, I'm not going to get them all. Uh, California, Colorado, uh, Oregon, Washington, and there's one more that I missed. It's on the East Coast, I can't remember which one it is. Anyway, there's 10 states that have legalized marijuana. 20 states have legalized medical marijuana, including Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, so if you live in uh, my home, not my, not my home state, but my, uh, the state where I live right now is Iowa. Uh, Iowa doesn't uh, allow legalized marijuana and they don't allow um, uh, medical marijuana. So if you were, if you needed marijuana to, and there was this guy, he's on television all the time, he's crying because he needs marijuana, he needs, he needs CBD oil, and he can't get it in Iowa. He could go next door. He could go across the river into Illinois and get it, but he can't do that because he lives in Iowa and he wanted to legalize marijuana. So that he could get it. Illinois has legalized marijuana. Has legalized medical marijuana. He could have gotten his CBD oil across the river. He could have gone down to Missouri and gotten medical marijuana. But he was trying to get it legalized in, in Iowa because, I don't know, getting in a car was too hard for him. He was, uh, they took him in a van to Colorado to smoke pot. And he was, it was all televised. My goodness, it was a terrible, terrible situation. Anyway, uh, he died. Probably from his lack of marijuana. And then, well, he's in pain. He's in a lot of pain. And I understand that. I, that's, that's fine. But... What would you do if that was, that was the case? Would you move to a state where you could actually use the stuff that you're, you need for, the, for your pain control? Was that what you would do? Or stay in Iowa and, and hurt? But he stayed in Iowa and hurt. Currently, the uh, drug that seems to be causing the most serious problems is uh, crystal, crystal meth uh, methamphetamines, opiates, and opioids. Uh, the opiates and opioids, as I said, uh, 2000, this whole thing kicked off. Uh, we do have a problem with heroin. Uh, they're talking about uh, building a wall so the uh, so fentanyl won't come across uh, the border. Where does fentanyl come from? Who manufactures this stuff? Mexico. Is it manufactured in Mexico? Mm -hmm. Colombia? Japan. Col I'm sorry. Japan. That's close. China. China. Yeah, China. I know it all. <laughs> in from China. Most of it comes in legally and then somehow it gets distributed in the United States. Uh, over the weekend, 
Over the weekend, there were 13 overdoses in uh, Chico, California, 13 overdoses. <clears throat> Everybody's unconscious. Uh, and, and the uh, police arrive, and they call the fire department, and one guy dies, and, and they're doing CPR in the other 12. I mean, it looks like a disaster. Well, it is a disaster area. It's somebody's house. Well, they're having a party, and uh, they use fentanyl and something else, and they haven't figured out what the second chemical was. Uh, that they used, but whatever it was, it was an accelerant, and it was had a synergistic effect with the with the fentanyl. So a lot of times the problem isn't the drug; it's the, a lot of times the problem is the drug plus a, plus something else. Uh, can you drink alcohol and smoke marijuana at the same time? Sure, you can. Of course, you can. What happens to you? Any ideas? Nothing happens to you. <laughs> Do they work against each other? I don't know. <laughs> it must be something. All that dopamine that just like is split, zipping around your brain. What does it do to you? Any ideas? My son had a problem with this. He was working at a bar and they legalized marijuana in, in Denver. And they legalized marijuana. He's working at a bar, so people would come in stoned. And they would order, you know, uh, two shots of tequila. Light them up right here. Light them up here. You know, okay. So they hit the first shot. They hit the second shot. They don't ever hit the third shot. It knocks them out. It puts you to sleep. So what happens? What, what are the laws about people passing out in a bar? What do you do with somebody that's passed out in a bar? Let them sleep it off? Put them in, drag them to the corner and let, let them sleep it off? What do you have to do? You have to call the cops. <laughs> so all these people come into, were coming into his bar, and, and he be, had to become a medic to not to really save their life. Well, sometimes, because one guy swallowed his tongue. I know. So, well, you know. If anyway. You, if you swallow your tongue, can you like, do it by That's usually what you do. Don't use your tongue. As soon as they, they regain consciousness, the first thing they do is bite down. So you have to use something to get them to down. Luckily, I talked to my son about this before, just joking, you know. Oh, don't ever use your finger, you know. So he, he used some kind of a tool that he had for mixing drinks and reached in there to the come back down. What happens is it's, uh, they just relax. They're, they don't really, you can't swallow them. Your tongue is attached to the bottom of your mouth. But it can slip back and, and block your esophagus. And that's what happens. So you have to reach in there and pull it out. Usually they pass out. They try to cough it out and it doesn't work. <clears throat> they pass out and pull, pull their tongue out. But like I said, the first thing that happens is they bite down. I've, I've known people that lost fingers. Yeah, <laughs> trying to pull somebody's tongue out. As funny as that is, not important. Okay, uh, so th there's a problem with mixing drugs. Uh, and there may be a problem with mixing marijuana with lots of stuff, but we don't know because we haven't done the experiments and we haven't, uh, we haven't done the autopsies yet. Uh, so we'll find out what, the, what they were using the fentanyl with. Now, fentanyl is, and as we're going to talk about fentanyl, fentanyl is an opiate, or an opioid. It's a, it's a synthetic, synthetic uh, opiate. And uh, it's 100 times stronger than morphine. So it's some pow powerful stuff. <clears throat> so why in, the world, how, why in the world would you use it for a high? It knocks you out. It's like Demerol. Why would you use it? And a lot of this stuff don't, that doesn't make any sense to me. Anyway, so if you mix drugs, a lot of times you get a synergistic effect. It's not one plus one, it's one times ten. And that's what happens with barbiturates and alcohol. You know, that's, you drink the alcohol, that's, that's one times the barbiturate, that should be one plus one equals two, right? No, the effect is, is a lot stronger than that because the alcohol accelerates the uh, barbiturate in your system uh, and, and that causes a, a negative reaction. 
So this is one of the problems with, with uh, mixing drugs. And these are usually the kids that die, is the ones that are mixing their drugs. Uh, if you talk to people that are drug users, they'll say, well, yeah, I had a lot of fun when I was a kid. I'd take anything, uh, LSD and methamphetamine and, and uh, ecstasy, and just take it all, you know, and like that one pill right after the other. Well, they were lucky that they didn't kill themselves. And these are the kids that usually do kill themselves. And that's one of the reasons why they don't know what that second drug was. Or at least it wasn't in the, in the paper. I'll have to, have to see if they have identified the second drug that these people were using. Fentanyl usually, potentially, if they took the right dosage, it shouldn't have killed them. It shouldn't have knocked them out. It arrests your, your uh, cerebellum, so you stop breathing, <laughs> which can't be a lot of fun. Okay, I know, I've, I've stopped breathing before. It isn't a lot of fun, let me tell you. Try it sometime. <laughs> Try holding your breath. It doesn't feel good. Uh, I've died a couple times. <clears throat> Uh, the most serious uh, problem in the United States at present seems to be the use of prescription drugs. And this, of course, is the opiates and opioids we were talking about before. Oh, here. I gave you a... Yeah, you go. The opiates and opioids. Uh, the uh, uh, syllabi are not designed. I haven't been able to catch the guy that's supposed to sign it. But I'll, as soon as I get it signed, I'll show you that he signed it. I'll sign it on the back. I decided not to sign it until this. Anyway. Uh, okay. Uh, so the most, of, uh, most serious problem right now is prescription drugs. And, and kids getting into their grandparents' uh, medicine cabinets and stealing the drugs. That sounds pretty serious. Opiates and opioids, especially opiates and opioids. Uh, hydrocodone and oxycontin. Uh, who's the guy? Oh, Rush Limbaugh had an oxycontin problem. And he was getting his uh, maid uh, to claim that she had a back problem. She would go to the doctor and she'd get oxycontin and then he would take her to oxycontin, which is illegal. He can't. Anyway, so what happened, to, what happened to Rush Limbaugh? Did he spend any time in jail since he was using somebody else's prescriptions? Is, that's illegal, by the way. Did he spend any time in jail? Does anybody remember him being off the air for just any length of time? Does anybody ever listen to Rush Limbaugh? <laughs> he, he didn't spend any time in jail. They shook their finger at him and told him not to do it anymore. <clears throat> yeah, and of course the prescription drugs are especially a problem with uh, with, with uh, teens. The biggest killer among all the addictions is smoking t uh, tobacco. Uh, tobacco is very toxic. Uh, it's not a, a positive thing. Uh, as you can, this is a, a lung. This is, this is what uh, your lungs look like if you don't smoke. This is what your lungs look like if you do smoke. So this stuff is pretty dangerous. If you're a chain smoker, which my friend was. I, I keep talking about my friend that died of a heart attack, but he was a smoker. Uh, and he told me that he quit smoking, and then he sent me a picture of, of him catching a fish. And he had this cigarette hanging out of the corner of his mouth like he was the coolest guy in the world with this fish. Uh, look at my fish. And it's out of the corner of his mouth like he's some kind of detective in an old movie or something. I was watching an old movie from the 40s last night. It uh, had Robert Mitchum in it. And every time, uh, every time he's walking along, he gets a cigarette out. It's like this. Light a cigarette. Every time he got into a room, he put a cigarette in his mouth and light a cigarette. It's something you don't see anymore. But in the old days, people used to chain smoke a lot. Uh, so tobacco's dangerous. Why haven't we? Why haven't we known this forever? It's, it kills people. It kills hundreds and thousands of people a year. So why haven't we talked about this before? Why is this a new thing? Well, it's new to me. It's not new to you guys, probably, because all of your life, tobacco companies, you still see these commercials on television or advertisements saying that the federal government is, is, is forcing uh, R.J. Reynolds and Laurel Lard and 
there's another one, there's three of them, three tobacco companies. It's forcing them to tell the public that uh, low tar and nicotine cigarettes are not, are not safe. That you can't do this. Another problem we're having in the United States is vaping. Vaping is just as dangerous as tobacco, as it turns out, despite the fact that they invented it as a, as a way to uh, uh, break your habit of, of smoking cigarettes, vaping. Now the kids are putting all kinds of interesting things in the, in the uh, uh, cigarettes. They're not illegal, or the, uh, the vaping tube or whatever it is. It's not illegal. And that's the problem. Uh, they can sell it to anybody. Uh, they're thinking of, uh, of uh, only allowing people over the age of 21 to vape. How well does that work? We made a law that, that said that uh, only you had, had to be 21 to drink alcohol. How, how well does that work? Is there anybody in here that drank alcohol before they were 21? Nobody? <laughs> I had a beer. <laughs> oh, there you go. I got two, three. Eight years old? You're eight years old. <laughs> Citizen's arrest. You're under arrest. <laughs> <laughs> I know, how do we keep this? <laughs> so marijuana has been illegal for like ever. And how do you keep how do you keep the kids from smoking marijuana? <laughs> Is it the kids from this 1970s that were smoking so much pot? Yeah. Yeah, it was. So it was illegal. How were they getting it? Where was it coming from? You know, my dad, he smokes marijuana, and, you know, he went to Vietnam, and when he went to Vietnam, he said that's when he started smoking marijuana. They go over there. And Not so, in the United States it? Army, no. Not for the Army, God. Oh, okay. So, he always <laughs> smoked. But it is in Vietnam. Yeah. He, that's where the, yeah, the Golden Triangle is. Yeah, so he's he's always forever smoked marijuana. He quit smoking cigarettes, but he still smoke still marijuana. smokes marijuana. How old is he? Um, he's seventy. Wait a minute. Oh, he's got to be my age if he was in Vietnam. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty good. And Seven's then pretty now, good for marijuana. now um, Bank has a medical marijuana dispensary, and he goes there and he gets it. But um, the is reason I'm mentioning it is because of his addiction, it trickled down to some of my siblings. Of course. And now they smoke it on a daily basis, just like, you know, with my dad and everything. And um, to me, it, it's really, it's awkward to see it. And it especially, especially being down here. Right. You know, because you hardly ever see anything like that, but you go home and then you're just Constantly right there in your house. It's so, annoying. so what are your siblings doing? These pot smoking siblings that smoke every day. What, what do you mean, like working wise? Yeah, or? working wise. Um, they have sister, good jobs. No, my sister. She stays home and takes care of my dad and everybody. And then my um, brother, he works at Town Pump uh, Security. Yeah, I know. It's just really crazy. <laughs> and, um, That's a good job. <laughs> I know. I know. And my, my sister did have one job before, though. You know, like, she's kind of like really dingy. She's, she's like 22. Dingy and marijuana. Do the two go together? <laughs> <don't you think? laughs> the problem, one of the problems with marijuana is it takes away your desire to do anything. It takes away what we refer to as volition. So you don't want to do anything. So you're kind of bummed. I have a friend that my, I have a friend that uh, starts smoking in Vietnam. And uh, the, the only thing he does during the day is look for more pot. <laughs> That's all he does. And he was living off his mother's social security checks. He was racing her to the post office I know. She's in her 90s, and, and you know he's in his 60s, and she, he's racing her to the, the post office to see who gets her, her Social Security check. And usually he won, because, well, he's... And she would have given him anything. I mean, she let him do this for an extended length of time. Has never held down a job for longer than, you know, five or six months. And here he is. He, uh, he has put uh, aluminum foil on all of the windows. 
in the basement. He lives in the basement of his mother's house. Isn't that cool? He's the coolest guy. <laughs> he's the guy. He's the guy that got his wife, his girlfriend, and his ex-wife pregnant at the same time. <laughs> I know. He's got to be the coolest guy in the world. He's my icon. <laughs> I want to be just like him if I ever grow up. <laughs> anyway, okay. The use of performance-enhancing drugs in sports has been an issue since the home run race between Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa in 1999. Uh, Barry Bonds, of course, hit 73 home runs in 2003, I think, uh, breaking uh, Mark McGuire's home run record. Uh, of course, now they now and and they won't put him in the Hall of Fame. They won't put any of these two guys in the Hall of Fame because of their drug usage. And they won't put Barry Bonds in the Hall of Fame, despite the fact that he holds all kinds of uh, records. Uh, he was walked, I don't know, 156 times one year, uh, which is a new record, which would be a new record, except, of course, he's, uh, he's a drug user. <clears throat> so uh, these three guys, and the pe people from their era, uh, the, the turn of the 21st century, uh, those individuals, uh, they won't put them in the, in the Hall of Fame, despite the fact that they have broken all the records, especially the home run record. Uh, Barry Bonds holds the, most home run, uh, the record for the most home runs uh, in, a, uh, in a career. He also holds a single season home run record, but he can't get into the Hall of Fame, as interesting as that is. And as you can see, they're pretty buff, they're pretty big. And McGuire evidently used uh, performance-enhancing drugs almost his, his entire career. Uh, not, not so much Sammy Sosa, not so much Barry Bonds, but uh, Mark McGuire was shooting up with uh, Jose Canseco, uh, another, one of the Bash brothers. They called him the Bash brothers. When they hit home runs, they really hit home runs. I mean, they hit long, long home runs. Um, it, is, it, is, it is accepted that steroids can cause damage. The new generations of performance enhancers have hit the sports scene that do questionable damage and are undetectable uh, through uh, drug testing. What was it, three years ago? Uh, Ryan Braun of the Milwaukee Brewers uh, won the MVP for that year, and after the season was over with, they discovered that he was on performance enhancing drugs during the season. Uh, so what did they do with his MVP award? Any baseball fans? I'm sorry? They didn't. No. <laughs> they banned him from playing the first 50 games of the next, of the next year. Uh, there is a problem with uh, performance enhancing drugs. There is a problem for the player. Um, and it doesn't have anything to do with, uh, with being caught. Well, it does. But uh, the problem is that uh, they, they tend to injure themselves. And the reason they injure themselves, uh, theoretically the reason they're taking performance enhancing drugs like steroids is so that they can get over an injury. But the reality is if you build up too much muscle and your body, and your, your, normally what will happen is your muscle is too big for your body. And if your muscle is that strong, potentially you can tear the muscle away from the bone. And that's what happens. So if you ever hear of a, a ball player ripping the muscle away from the bone, this is something that you <laughs> this is something that can't happen unless you're taking steroids. If uh, so, if they rip a muscle away from the bone, uh, then usually it's a, it's a steroid problem. They've got their muscles are way way bigger than they're supposed to be. Now the reality is that well, if you go into the weight room and try to max out uh, with bench pressing or whatever. Uh, you, you can only lift a certain amount of weight. But the deal with steroids is now all of a sudden you can lift more weight. And before, if you're not taking steroids, you can't lift that weight because your muscles can only get so big. But if you take steroids, they get bigger, and now you can lift more weight than you're supposed to lift. So you injure yourself. yourself. I had a friend, uh, my daughter was living with this guy who was a bodybuilder. Uh, in, uh, down in Phoenix, <clears throat> and uh, he tore his pec away from his chest. It just, he just ripped it. <laughs> and uh, at that point, she realized he was taking steroids, and uh, she stopped having anything to do with him. He was her roommate. She, she kicked him out because of that. Anyway, steroids, not good. There uh, has been an immense growth of uh, computer games. 
Uh, cell phone usage and other online problems such as pornography. Uh, the number one reason for people going on the, the internet is not uh, uh, playing Candy Crush. I know that's a shock to almost everybody. It's not Facebook. It's not trying to find out what Donald Trump has said today. That's not it. It's usually it's pornography. The number one reason for people to go onto the internet is pornography. It is the one of the uh, most lucrative businesses you can you can be in today. As strange as that may seem, so is pornography is, and it can become an addiction. Uh, people that uh, view pornography at work, you know, they can get in a lot of trouble for viewing pornography at work. Uh, that's an addiction if they can't not look at pornography at, at some select moment. There's somebody in the room looking at pornography right now. You, then you may think you may think to yourself. He's looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I've got a problem. Okay, if I can't stay away from that stuff uh, during class. <laughs> no, she's okay. <laughs> Or video games. I've had people play video games. I had a guy that would play video games. He would sit in the back of the room uh, in the corner so that I couldn't get around behind him to see what was going on. And he'd play video games back there. He turned the sound off, thank goodness. But then he got an earpiece and he started listening to it. So, <laughs> And it was, in, it was actually in this class. Uh, drugs, drug use and abuse. Uh, with the increase of technology, psychologists have been behind the addiction power curve in identifying problems that people are having. And this is a problem that we have in psychology. When do we address this? We can only address it after it becomes a, a, a problem. And that's what's happened with pornography. So if you, you can read all the psychology texts that you want. Uh, there's, there will be only a handful of articles about addiction uh, uh, pornography, uh, addiction of uh, computer game usage, cell phone cell phone usage. We've got one person on their cell phone right now. I'm sure you're texting somebody important. Is it somebody important? <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Uh, when I was at Ashford, uh, all my students would be on the phone, almost, like almost the whole class. And I was thinking, is anybody listening to me? Is there anybody out there? <laughs> Guess what he just said? He swore. Oh my God. <laughs> Don't text anybody. Else, okay? <laughs> anyway, this is a problem. And the problem is that sometimes we don't identify it. And, and it takes a long time before we identify it. Look how long it took for the AMA to admit that they made a mistake back in 2000. And they really haven't admitted that they've made a mistake yet. They are still under the same protocol. If you go to the doctor, uh, if you go to the doctor with a skin rash, they always do the same thing. Why? Because it's protocol. In order not to get sued, you, they, they have to treat you in the same way that everybody treats you. They create these protocols. <clears throat> and sometimes the protocols, almost always they're accurate. But sometimes they're wrong. And I think the, the whole pain thing is, there. I think they're inaccurate about that. We have a lot of people that are, are drug seekers. They go to the doctor just to get more opiates, or opioids, actually. They're looking for OxyContin or hydrocodone. This is a really serious problem up in Montana. My, my wife was working, well, you know that. <laughs> my wife was working at a, a rural health clinic. We were in the car, and her health clinic was in between two reservations. Fort Belknap and uh, Rocky Point, and she would get a lot of drug seekers, and they didn't they didn't distribute they didn't uh, uh, distribute any uh, opiates or opioids, uh, but they had lots of people coming in and asking asking them for drugs. And what they would do today, I've got gasoline, so I'll go to the doctor and try to get some drugs in Haver, and then I'll go down to Great Falls and I'll try to and I'll get drugs. In in Great Falls from another doctor. My, uh, one of my friends was saying that she walked out of Browning IHS and there was people actually standing there asking, you know, I'll buy, 
I'll buy um, your prescription from you and everything. And so a lot of people sell it, but um, some people have gotten smart and they go to Canada and they get um, Tylenol free where you can just buy it over the counter. Mm -hmm. And then Suboxone, I, are, are you going to cover Suboxone? No. Is, um, I don't know what Suboxone is, but it's like a clinic that they opened up in Cut Bank and they said they opened it up to wean the people off of, I don't know if it's meth or pills or whatever it is. You remember what was going on with meth up in Montana? Yeah. Oh, like 10 years ago. Yeah. Like 15 years ago. So now they have this Suboxone and people are um, getting hooked on this Suboxone. I, I don't know what it is. Well, look at us. you got a computer right now. But you told me not You're the to one that came up with it, so you have to look it up. <laughs> Suboxone, S Y B O X I N. Just try it. Suboxone. Okay. I mean, you're the one that knows about it. I have no clue what it is. They keep coming up with new drugs. So there's lots of problems out there, and there are lots of problems that we're not recognizing. I watched a movie on Saturday. Uh, first player, player number one. It's a Steven Spielberg movie. It's about sometime in the future, and they've created this alternate reality uh, that uh, you can put on your those glass thing, those glasses, and okay, and then you go to this different reality. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, Ready Player One. Ready Player One. Yeah, great movie. I really enjoyed it, but that can become an addiction. I mean, it really can. So if you've got these things on your head and you're, you're living in, I don't know, I don't know, in, in that world, or you're living in, in one of these, uh, these, uh, uh, these computer games where you're, you're shooting Nazis or something, or zombies or whatever, I mean, that can become real to you. <coughs> if your icon, if your Avatar. Avatar. If, you, if your avatar is more real to you than your real person, and that was part of the movie, was they didn't. These guys had, had their their avatars were you know these uh, gorgeous, gorgeous creatures and these very, very powerful creatures. But of course, in reality, they were avatars for somebody that looked like something else, and that was part of the part of the movie was the real people getting together and going. And this one lady was this fabulous warrior, and uh, she was gorgeous, and she had these huge eyes, and and then uh, uh, and, and her real real character had a, a, a birthmark on her on her eye. Okay. Anyway. Sorry, I, I spoil, spoiler alert. I just <laughs> spoiled the movie for everybody. But we could become addicted to that. There are people that don't like living in the world that they live in, so they want to create a new world. This may be one of the reasons why people take drugs. This may be one of the reasons why people play video games. Uh, it may be one of the reasons why that 21-year-old guy in Wisconsin murdered those two people and then captured the 13-year-old. He saw her, at it and he has admitted that uh, he did it. He murdered the, the two parents, and he did capture her. He saw her getting onto a bus, and he decided that he was going to take her at that point. Is that love? Is it lust? What is it? And he shows no remorse. None whatsoever. Not even a little bit. <clears throat> as interesting as that is, what fantasy world does he live in? Where you can murder two people, kidnap somebody, take them out into the, the woods to a cabin and live there for the rest of your life. There was a guy in Germany that captured a teenage girl, uh, locked her up in the basement, and she was down there for 23 years. I think they had six kids together. And finally one day, one of the kids died. Um, so she had seven kids, but six of them died. Six, six of them lived. Uh, and eventually, of course, she escaped. Uh, and the sad part was that she was living in the, the basement, and she had to bend over in order to walk around because it was, he had built, uh, it was weird. The same thing happened in Austria. There was a guy that, that uh, fell in love with his daughter. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so he locked her up in the basement and made babies with her, as fun as that would sound. Anyway, so 
there's there's a lot of there's a lot of problems out there, and, and these are problems that you guys are going to have to deal with. I'm too old uh, to even worry about it. I mean, I'm I didn't couldn't even remember the name of that movie. <coughs> My cell phone, I don't I don't even know how to get text messages. I really don't know. And my wife tried to teach me. <laughs> oh, you don't have the right icons on you. <laughs> Uh, they get mad at me downstairs because I don't, they will email me something and I don't know until I read my emails. I mean, some people get them on their phones, emails on your phones. How many people get emails on your phones? Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, God. I, I don't want that kind of communication, okay? I, I don't want them getting pissed off at me and writing me an email and me, then me finding out about it right away. I'd like to rather find out about it this afternoon when I'm sitting in my office where I can swear up on top of the store and nobody will hear me except Travis who comes in there. You don't care if I swear, do you? <laughs> you figure I'm just a lost cause anyway, right? <laughs> oh man, so there's lots and lots of problems out there. There have been lots and lots of problems for an extended length of time. The problem with history is we only see certain things. We only see what we're looking at. We're not seeing it, everything. Uh, we know that the Nazis took over in Germany in, 19, in, in 1933. What was going on before 1933? Why did the Nazis take over? What was going on? What, what was the common person in Germany doing in, 19, in 1932? Why were they willing to let Adolf Hitler become their chancellor. What was going on? Was um, something? Was that when they, like, um, they persecuted the Jews? Yeah. yeah. First they made them put stars on their, on their shoulders, yellow. And then they put them in concentration camps. And then they killed them. That's what Hitler had. Why did they let them do that? Why did why did everybody in the world why why when the Jewish people were trying to find some place to live why would wouldn't the United States allow them in the United States? Why wouldn't England? Why wouldn't France? Well, France did, but why wouldn't Russia? Why didn't these countries allow them to immigrate to their country? What was going on? So Hitler's pissed off at the Jews. And the German people are kicking them all out. And these people are trying to escape in droves. The only ones that they allowed to escape were the ones that had skills that, that they were looking for. The, the famous violinist, uh, Freud was able to escape. Erickson was able to escape. All the individuals with, that had medical degrees, were, they, they accepted them. Well, what about the common, everyday Jewish person that, that uh, owns a, a store down on the corner? They, couldn't find any place to go. They wouldn't allow them. They got on ships and, and they wouldn't allow the ships to dock. Sounds like down, <laughs> down on the border, doesn't it? So who um, diagnosed Hitler with um, general um, diagnosis? Oh, we diagnosed him with a lot of different things. Most of it was propaganda. What would you diagnose? What would you diagnose uh, Donald Trump as having? Do we have any diagnosticians that want to? DID. <laughs> <laughs> He's definitely narcissistic. Do we do that? Can we do that? Well, Chris is pissed because he thinks he's the best president we've ever had. <laughs> How about Putin? Can we diagnose Putin? How about uh, Un, that Yahoo in uh, North Korea that took a, a anti-aircraft gun and executed his uncle with an anti-aircraft. <laughs> it's got a roundabout. It's a big <laughs> He stood him up in front of that thing and just shot it. Kill him quick, though. I mean, it's not like he was going, ah, my last word. <laughs> no, pretty much blew him up. He was pretty good. Uh, do we really do this? Do we really diagnose people that, that uh, nobody has said anything about? Do we? What have we diagnosed the guy in Las Vegas with? Anything? 
Did he have a problem? Did he have a problem? We want to know. Don't we? Because we don't want it to happen again. 63 years old. 63 year olds don't mass 18,000 rounds of, of ammunition and, and buy all those automatic weapons or make all these weapons automatic. And then shoot as many people as they possibly can. Do they? I'm 69. Okay. I'm not 63. <laughs> Old people don't do that. It's young people that do it. How about, uh, when was the last time a, uh, an African American uh, killed a lot of people? Does any, can anybody think of any time where they, they were mass, mass murderers? Can you think of, how about white guys? Like almost every day. Well, black feet, black people, I was going to say black feet. Black feet. <laughs> <laughs> black people, they do drive by, you know, and so that's almost like a mass murder. Could be, could be, yeah. It has yeah, happened. Like, you just never see the. I don't know. When was the last city? time it happened? I think they're. Okay. What did you find out about the box? The box is. Uh, it contains um, a combination of. Buprenorphine and not no noxolin, and it's an opiate ep medication, sometimes called a narcotic. Noxolin blocks the effects of opiate medication, including pain relief or feelings of what well-being that can lead to opiate abuse. Okay, that first drug you were talking about is an antidepressant. It's an antidepressant, but it's one of the antidepressants that doesn't increase your serotonin level. And because it doesn't increase your serotonin level, you don't have a um, uh, imp imp impotence reaction to, uh, to the drug. That's uh, Boost Bar. It's, it's the uh, major substance in Boost Bar. So when was the last drive-by shooting? Try, let's try drive-by shooting. What do we get? What do we have? There was a drive-by shooting. Where was it? And they killed a 12-year-old girl in Chicago, I think. Yeah, but they didn't kill anybody else, just a 12-year-old. And so everybody's pissed off that they were targeting the 12-year-old girl. And there are all these guys behind her, and they shot the 12-year-old girl. Did they ever uh, catch the guy? Uh, was, yeah, the was was there, were, there were three guys. In there. Yeah, well. I, I typed it in. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I get. It's hard man, stupid, the bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't I know. Not really? Oh, that's Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's really happened. I, I remember when that happened. All those white people being killed by all those black people. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, so the reality is, the reason that I, I brought up Hitler is because we really don't understand the historical uh, significance or the, what was going on at that time. Uh, we just get little pieces of information, just little tiny pieces of information. And that's one of the reasons why uh, Marius' uh, classes are so important. Uh, why did Freud, what was Freud doing, what was going on in the world, and why did Freud come up with, uh, with his theory? Uh, what was going on with Erickson? What was going on at the time that uh, uh, Jung came up with his theories? Why did he come up with these theories? If we understand the time, then a lot of times we understand why they did it, where it comes from. People have complained about Freud because Freud, uh, one, of the, one of his theories states that uh, women uh, have what he referred to as penis envy. In other words, women want to be men. And that's why they sometimes have hyster hysterical uh, re reactions to things. Okay. Uh, and of course, the feminists think that that's just the most god awful thing you can possibly say. But Freud wrote his theory in, 18, in the 1880s. Well, what the hell is going on in the 1880s? Well, well, certainly the feminist movement wasn't going on in the 1880s. But well, what was going on in the 1880s? Well, in the 1880s, in the place where he lived, Women couldn't own property. And, and 
where he lived, um, if you were wealthy enough, you, the, you maintained not only a household with your wife and your children, but you also uh, maintained a shadow household with, with a mistress and potentially other children, if you were wealthy enough. And if you've ever watched the movie Gigi, that's what the whole movie Gigi is about. It's about this shadow uh, life that, that all these wealthy people live. Uh, when the Titanic went down, Vanderbilt uh, was on the ship with his mistress, his pregnant mis mistress. And they both went down with the ship. They both went down with the, with the uh, one of the Vanderbilts, one of the richest Vanderbilt. So he was, and his, of course his wife and his children were at home in New York. And here he was sailing back and forth uh, between Europe and the United States with his mistress, with his pregnant mistress. He was living visibly to, to everyone. Uh, I used to work for an organization that uh, the people that owned the, the uh, this was Ashford University, the people that owned the university would have parties and uh, they would have, the families would come in and they would have the party. Then they would have a second party. And the second party was for their mistresses. <laughs> And if, and if you were cool, you had, you not only had a wife, but you also had a mistress because, you know, these guys are millionaires, so they can afford this kind of stuff. But I had a friend that would, was invited to these parties, and all he had was a wife. He didn't have a mistress. So they argued as to whether he could go to these parties with his wife because his wife, of course, they didn't want people to know that these guys were messing around with other women. I know. Isn't that weird? This is in San Diego like five years ago, okay? <laughs> so this kind of stuff is happening now. Uh, one of the problems they had in Mexico, <clears throat> one of the problems they had in Mexico, Mexico was making tons and tons of money off of their oil reserves that, were, that they found off of Mexico. And so they had this, the government owned the, the, this oil company. As soon as the oil, res oil reserves started to go away and the price of oil went down, uh, the economy in, in Mexico uh, tanked, and so these Mexi uh, Mexican uh, millionaires, they had to, to decide what they were, how they were going to survive, because they had always had a wife and they had always had a mistress. So all of these women that had become mistresses, now they had to find something else to do. Before they were just living in the apartment waiting for daddy to come home. You know? Is this real? <laughs> I've never been a millionaire, so I didn't have to worry about it, I guess. Anyway, okay. So, we don't understand historical context. So, when we talk about these things, it's like we're, we're uh, uh, trying to break the, into the atmosphere and we just kind of skip off. We're just getting little pieces of information. Uh, if you really want to know what was going on in, in uh, what are we going to talk about first? Uh, with early man, you know, well, all we're talking about is little bit, bitty pieces of information. I can't give you all the information. A lot of times we don't know uh, what was going on pre-Columbian with, uh, with the Diné people. Do we know? Where does that information come from? Do you know? Are you sure? Or did... Well, this is probably this. I've had this conversation with Travis before. Do we know? We have traditions, right? But how many of those traditions were skewed by the Spanish? How many of them were skewed by the uh, by the people in, uh, from the United States? How, how how many traditions were changed because of Christianity? Just something to think about. <clears throat> so we don't, unless it was written down, unless somebody is exactly sure what was going on, we don't really know. We're not really sure. Anyway, okay, so unless it's written down, we don't know. And sometimes, who wrote it down? Who was the guy that wrote it down? A lot of the history of the ancient world came from a guy named Herodotus. Well, Herodotus was a, was a, a Roman uh, historian, and some of the stuff that he wrote down it's impossible. You know, he, was, he talked about people with animal bodies and, and human heads. And, and he talked about Amazonian women, or Amazon, Amazons who 
who the women would, uh, they were like, um, like with those spiders, they would uh, breed with somebody and then they would kill them, slit their throats. Uh, so, and it was just a, a, a culture of, of women, and they were they were, they were female warriors. Was, did this ever did this ever exist? He talked about Atlantis, but we can't find it. We're not exactly sure it was there. So we're not exactly sure. Early man saw his world as mysterious and dangerous, and they had a basic need to cope with his environment. Uh, early man discovered that uh, by ingesting certain plants, they could ease their fear and anxiety, reduce pain, treat some illnesses, give them pleasure, and assist them in, in talking with their gods, whoever their gods might have happened to be. The human brain responds to psychoactive substances, and that's the reason that we use it. When people suffer from mental illnesses or behavioral addictions, the altered state of consciousness makes the individual feel better. And that's what we're trying to do. Now this is really kind of interesting. How happy are you supposed to be? Is it okay to be a little unhappy? <clears throat> is it, does it have to do with your culture? Does your culture tell you how happy you have to be? My dad grew up in a household where if you laughed, they, they were kind of religious. If you laughed, then you were being frivolous. I know. But my dad grew up, well, of course, he raised his family <laughs> away from, from those crazy, my crazy relatives. Uh, but a lot of times when we were sitting around the table, and this is especially when we became older, uh, I'm the joker in the family. So I would, I would get everybody laughing, and my dad would say, that's enough. You guys, you guys are being too frivolous. But uh, and that, was, that was the... Uh, uh, the Normal, normal thing for, for his family was not to laugh, was not to smile. Life is too serious to smile, smile a lot. I know. You, you agree with that? Life is too serious to smile. So he started smiling as soon as I said that. <laughs> Psychoactive substances make the individual feel better, and that's why we do it. And that's why we do it voluntarily. Uh, so we take drugs to make ourselves feel better. We take, I don't know, uh, we drink alcohol, we smoke pot, we uh, take uh, crystal meth. Is there, are there any drugs that make you unhappy? Has anyone ever taken heroin? <laughs> None of you have ever even had any alcohol to drink. I, I forget it. Everybody raises their head. <laughs> Does heroin make you feel good? Have you ever wondered what... What, why are these people after this stuff? What does it do to you? Does it make you feel good? Does it make you feel happy? Is it like pot? You start laughing about everything? Somebody farts and everybody just thinks it's the funniest thing in the world, even though it smells so bad you can barely stand it. <laughs> <laughs> So, is, does heroin make you feel good? I think it does. Like, um, <clears throat> like here's a story. A lady who, she was very successful. Well, she has diabetes, so she started taking opiates like um, Oxycontin and Hydrocodone and all those pills. And she moved to a bigger city. And this past Christmas, um, we got a call that she was in the hospital in a coma. And um, the reason why is because she was taking her away, but her boyfriend beat her up really bad. And so when they brought her in and everything, they didn't think she was going to make it. And um, they, they put her in a coma. She didn't go into a coma. Right. They put her into a coma because... Um, she was getting weaned off of the, the heroin, so she kept pulling her tube out and everything. And, you know, this person was a hierarchy here at the college, you know, and it was, it was just really shocking because um, it seems like, and I know this because I've taken chemical dependency, but it seems like um, one drug leads to another, 
like marijuana, you know, you just smoke marijuana, but next thing you know, you're taking opiates, and then next thing you know, you're taking heroin, and then next thing you know, you're in a coma. You know what I mean? So... Does it make you feel good? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it does. It makes you forget. <clears throat> oh, okay. I was just, I Googled it, and yeah. it said, you know, when you take it, it's a rush, and a good feeling, and that brings happiness. It but brings... But it's slowly, yeah, but it... So they give you morphine when they not try to when they uh, when they're doing surgery. They give you morphine so you'll forget the surgery. Okay, that's why they give it to you. That's why they put morphine in the bolus with with fentanyl. Fentanyl knocks you out, and the morphine's supposed to make you forget. The morphine doesn't work on me. Whoops. Okay. <laughs> so they hit me with this stuff, thinking I'll forget the surgery. I woke up twice during during my last. Uh, Heart uh, I woke up right after, right after the surgery was over. No, you're supposed to you know, recover. They send you to the recovery room to wake up. I woke up and the operator, <clears throat> and I didn't forget anything. Damn it! <laughs> it hurts. They were they cut me. They stuck they stuck this garden hose in my artery, and they ran it up through my, my arteries and down into my heart. Yes, it is. Congratulations. we got two chairs over here. So it's going to be interesting to see, see who you sit beside. <laughs> Sorry, friends. <laughs> Maybe next time. <laughs> what time is it? How am I doing? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> uh, governments ruling classes and religious entities have sought to control the supply of drugs through growing, uh, manufacturing, distribution, uh, taxing, and prohibition. Uh, religions will do this, especially if the religions are in charge of the, uh, of the area, of the community. Religions will try to control this. Really? Religions? Uh, is anybody ever, is, is anybody a, uh, a Latter-day Saint? You're not supposed to drink alcohol. If you're latter day Saint. you're not supposed to drink caffeine, no stimulants. So the religion tries to control what you do. If you're a Baptist, Baptists aren't supposed to dance. What else are they not supposed to do? Everything, you're not supposed to do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're supposed to drink. I grew up in a Methodist Methodist community, and my uh, neighbor used to hide his beer bottles out in the, out in the bar. He would drink. Uh, for some reason, he couldn't milk cows unless he was had a beer. <laughs> so, he would hide his beer bottles out in the out in the uh, barn, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, my people didn't drink, so uh, except my dad would. Uh, my dad was in World War II, and evidently, while he was over in France, um, when it was time, uh, when they got some time off, uh, they would uh, find some alcohol and drink it to forget. They're trying to forget. Uh, so he came out, out back from the war, uh, not, not drinking a lot, but uh, with a f taste for alcohol. Uh, but he, the only time, my mom, my mom, God, didn't want to cross my mom. But uh, he didn't drink at home. The only time he drank was when he went, uh, he was in the reserves. So his two weeks, he would take a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> oh, my dad, he's so funny. <laughs> anyway, so he'd only drink uh, when he was around other military people, which was kind of funny. So he would uh, take a bottle of whiskey, I mean a fifth of whiskey, and uh, he'd come back with, you know, about that much in the bottom. So I'm not sure how much he drank and how much he and his buddies drank. But, but that's the only time I saw him drink. <clears throat> My mother liked rum. That's the only thing she would drink was rum. And I, rum, has anybody ever tasted rum? No, you guys have never had anything. <laughs> rum tastes like shit. It really tastes bad. It tastes like kerosene. Anyway, ancient Sumerian medicine men used opium as a secret medicine. Uh, so opium comes from that portion of the world, the, uh, uh, the Middle East. Uh, so it was used in Sumeria as a secret medicine. 
as exciting as that is. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt would dole out beer to uh, keep their laborers uh, building their pyramids. Uh, and of course, we have tried, we have made, uh, we've found the, uh, the uh, recipes that the uh, Egyptians used, and we have reproduced those recipes to make beer. I guess it's not very good, from what I understand. <clears throat> Cocoa leaves were controlled and doled out uh, by Incan uh, rulers in Peru to maintain the needed laborers in the country that they controlled. Uh, the Inca Empire was actually on the western side of the Andes Mountains. Now, interestingly, the uh, coca, coca doesn't grow on, on the eastern slope of uh, the Andes. It grows on the western slope of the Andes. So we, uh, if you look at Peru, Peru goes down to the ocean, of course, uh, so the Incan Empire was on the east, the western slope of the Andes Mountains, down to the, down to the uh, ocean, and they were growing coca on the other side. So uh, uh, if we look at where where the cocaine comes today from today in that area, it comes from uh, Colombia, it comes from Peru, uh, the western slope of Peru. It grows in the Amazon Valley actually, <clears throat> up in the mountains. Uh, so they would trade with the, with the natives that were picking all this co these coca leaves, as interesting and fascinating as that is. When the Spanish got there, uh, the Spanish would uh, control the growing of the coca leaves to increase their tax revenues. Uh, the Spanish were into money. They were really into money. Uh, the Span they were always looking for gold, wherever they were. Uh, if you remember any of the stories about uh, what the Spanish did when they, when they captured uh, Montezuma, uh, when they captured the, the Incan uh, king, uh, they, demanded, uh, they demanded a room full of gold. They were always looking for gold. The first thing they did in, uh, when, when they landed in the Caribbean is they made the, the natives on the island uh, give them gold. And if they couldn't give them gold, they cut their hands off. Well, there was no gold on the island, so guess what happened? They cut everybody's hands off. They killed almost everybody on the island, as sad as that is. Spanish were always looking for gold or silver. They were looking for riches. And of course, <clears throat> they were able to do that. One of the things that happened when uh, the English came to the United States, Jamestown in 1617, uh, they were looking for gold in Virginia. Well, there is no gold in Virginia, but they were looking for it. And so these people, instead of growing food, like smart people, uh, they, <laughs> they, they look for gold, they mined for gold in the swamps of Virginia, and they found um, nothing. Um, my family were Quakers, I think I told you this story. My family were Quakers and they landed in New Jersey. I'm, I'm, I'm about done. They, when they landed in New Jersey, and the people, they, they bought the land from rich people in, in, uh, in England, and they demanded a certain payment, so they would look for gold to make those payments. And of course, there is no gold in New Jersey either. So they sent, uh, they, they couldn't pay. <laughs> so they sent uh, a sheriff over, and the sheriff was named Bradway, the guy that, that uh, was the Quaker that ran the... Uh, brought everybody over. His name was Bradley too, so they were both named Bradley, which gets really confusing. So the good guy and the bad guy were both named Bradley. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you can see me as both a good guy and a bad guy. Okay, well we're going to stop right here and talk about, we'll talk about this uh, on Thursday. On Thursday I will wear a uh,